All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to Data Programming 1. Today we have an awesome lecture about recursion. Uh, recursion is pretty simple and at the same time can be really difficult. It's just something that refers to itself. Uh, the title slide here today is a great example of this. The title slide uh, contains an image of the title slide, which contains an image of the title slide all the way on down. Um, so basically, uh, just something that refers to itself. Uh, recursive definitions in a dictionary contain the word they're defining, generally considered bad practice. Recursive data structures contain other data structures of the same type. We've already seen lists of lists in CSV files. That's what we're talking about there. And recursive functions, that's the main focus of today, are just functions that call themselves. Now, this can be really difficult, too. And there are some subtle tricks that make all of this work in a meaningful way. And that's where the difficulties come in. I remember learning this stuff for the very first time. There was this problem, there was a little game, and my teacher showed us a recursive algorithm that solved a very simple version of this game, one that just had three pieces, um, and then showed us how they could use a recursive function that, based on that very simple version, a function that called itself that could solve even more complicated versions of the problem. So it could solve a four-piece version, and then a five-piece version, and then a seven-piece version, whatever. To this day, I can still remember that recursive algorithm, and I still cannot solve that problem without the recursive algorithm. I don't know. I know it's possible, but it makes my brain hurt, and I've never figured it out. All right, so recursion can be a really powerful technique, which is why we're including in this class. All right, um, as we get going today, let me just advance the slide here. A quick review of where we are. We have an exam coming up in just under two weeks now. And so I want to just put things in context. So the first five weeks of the course were about programming fundamentals, uh, control flow. We talked about um, conditional statements with the if statements, loops, the while loop, for loop, we had two different kinds of for loops, um, you know, basic control flow. And part two of the course, the second five weeks, are about data structures. So the first two we introduced were lists and dictionaries. We also had sets and tuples. Oh, with lists and, dic and dictionaries, these are the main, most important ones. With these two data structures, you can basically solve any data organization problem that you'll be faced. All right, after that, we moved on and talked about data files. We talked about uh, comma-separated values, uh, files, uh, CSV, which are essentially represented as lists of lists in Python. We also talked about JSON files. A little more versatile, we can basically put anything into a JSON file, including dictionaries. Um, then we moved on and talked about objects and references. This is conceptually one of the more difficult topics, but understanding this is going to help you debug your code. And it, it uh, not understanding exactly how this works, under, you know, missing the fact that when I say x equals y, that X is now referring to the same thing that Y does can lead to some really subtle errors that, you know, may return an answer, but it may be the wrong answer. And, you know, you may be changing a variable that actually changes another variable too. So it leads to some tricky stuff while we're spending some time on. It's going to be a major focus of our exam. All right, after that, uh, we've got three sort of specialty topics about functions. I'm just going to call them fancy functions. Uh, today is recursion. Uh, Monday will be generators, and then we're going to learn on Wednesday that functions are actually objects. I can take a variable, and I can assign a function to it. It'll be an object over in Python Tutor on the object side of a variable on the right. I can pass that to other functions. Cool stuff. Um, so after these three topics, these are all kind of hard. Yeah, from objects and references all the way down to functions or objects, challenging stuff. So from there, we're going to move into some easier stuff. We'll have a lecture on files, uh, a lecture on errors, and that's going to be it for what's on the exam, if I remember correctly. All right. I also forgot to mention as we get started, there is a lecture 22 template. I think this is misnamed. I think we're on lecture 21, but uh, I lost count once we got above 10, ran out of fingers. Um, check this out. The very first thing, we're going to do a little review of copying. So go ahead and copy and paste this code into Python Tutor so we get that picture on the right side. We'll go ahead, we'll uncomment each of these. You guys can follow along. Um, the rest of this is just some, some guidelines to help take notes during class and uh, some examples that we'll develop together at the end. All right, so I'm going to jump over to Python Tutor where I've already copied this material. 
I have this set up in the version that renders all objects on the heap. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, we're going to be reviewing copying real quick. So I'm importing the copy module. Uh, I've got x is equal to a list that contains a single list that contains a single list that has two objects in it. They're strings, the string hello and the string world. So when I look over here, uh, I've got copy, which is this module that I've imported. So I can refer to copy. I can use the functions in this module. It's available in the global frame. Then I've got x. x is a refers to a list that's got one element. So it has a reference to another list. One element at position 0, that's referring to a list. That list has two things in it. Those objects are both strings. The first string is hello, and the second string is world. Okay, I'm going to switch this back to inline primitives, don't nest objects. And the reason I can get away with this is because hello and world are both strings, and those are immutable. And I think this is a really important concept here. I, I can get away with this because I can never change this object. So as I draw more and more um, data structures over here that contain reference to this hello, I can put them each in their own box. If they ever do try and change it, if they try and change it, it'll give them an error. If they reassign it to a different, reassign that um, index, that element right there, to a different word, it just is going to get a new copy of the new word. Um, not a copy, it's going to get a new word, a new string. All right, so uh, this is the innocent live version, but because these things are immutable, it works great. I can just put the word right in this box. All right. So we're already quite familiar with the idea of making a reference copy. This is the easy one. Here's the idea. I'm creating a new variable y, and y is going to refer to the same thing that x does. So it didn't actually make any new objects. That makes a great multiple choice question. How many new objects are created when this happens? How many new objects are created when this happens? All right, great multiple choice question. This one doesn't make any. It's just creating another way to get to this data. I can change this data with either x or y. I can append something to this, and both of these will be able to see it. That change is visible to both of them. Okay, I'm going to put this back. I'm going to move down, and I'm going to do the deep copy one next. Uh, the last example, one I did last time, didn't really fit on the screen very well. It was too big, so this is a much better choice. Here we have, I'm creating a deep copy. That means it's going to follow all of the arrows. All right quick reminder that depth is how many arrows do I need to follow. So right here from x, there's one, two, and three levels of depth. And deep copy will make copies of everything. It doesn't just copy this first list right there. It doesn't just copy the second list right there. It doesn't copy just the third one there. We made a copy. It continues to going all the way down until absolutely everything is copied. We're not going to have any references connecting these two data structures at all when we're done. Everything will be a brand new version. All right. So the reference copy, people are generally familiar with that. We've been using that a bunch throughout the course. Deep copy is the one that just makes sense. If you're making a copy, you should copy everything. However, there are times when a shallow copy is the best choice. Um, this is only going to copy one level deep. It's going to make exactly one new object. So, and that object is going to be a copy of whatever's at the end of the first arrow. Uh, the contents of that, if these uh, elements in the list or elements in the dictionary or whatever refer to other things, they're going to refer to the same thing. Okay, so this, my x list right here, refers to that object, that list. So that means when I make a shallow copy, I've got a new list here with one element, and that element is going to refer to the very same list right there. All right, so this is probably the most confusing one. There are some places where this is applicable, where it is uh, usable, um, and has some advantages over deep copy. Deep copy does extra work. If I don't need to make all new copies of Hello World, uh, if I want to keep the same strings, but, you know, uh, I want to just like rearrange things in this list, like sort it, but keep all the same references, then a shallow copy is most certainly appropriate. All right, so I want to just go through a number of examples of places where we have recursion and sort of define what's going on by way of examples. So here I have some definitions from the dictionary, uh, and those definitions use the term they're defining. So um, the goal is to use it in a meaningful way so that you still communicate. 
So, for example, Hofstadler's law says that it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadler's law. So, here, Hofstadler's law is using its own term in the definition, yet it's still meaningful. And, by the way, this is really great advice. Studying for that exam coming up in two weeks will take you longer than you expect. Uh, P8 came out this week, will take you longer than you expect. So, heads up. Um, but, uh, self-reference is not always used in a meaningful way. Uh, from the definition from Wikipedia of circular definition, uh, dialectic materialism is materialism that involves dialectic. If, to be honest, I still don't know what this means. Um, and I looked it up. I added this to the slide last year. Um, yeah, this is meaningless. This is garbage. Um, they're using the terms to define in the definition. Yeah, um, I did put the definition in. It's something from my uh, political science or philosophy, the Marxist theory adopted as the official Soviet, um, official philosophy of the Soviet communists, put the words in the right order, Mike, uh, that political and historical events result from the conflict of social forces and are interpretable as a series of contradictions in their solutions. The conflict is, to believe, is believed to be caused by material needs. Uh, this is pretty deep, way beyond me. Uh, I don't do that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, oh, mounds and hills. I got this one, though. So another example of something that's not particularly useful. Um, in this case, we have a circular reference. So uh, self-reference doesn't always happen directly. So in this case, a mountain is a landmass that projects conspicuously above its surrounding and is higher than a hill. Okay, so we go look up hill. And hill is usually rounded nature, natural elevation of land lower than a mountain. Uh, for a computer, we're in trouble, because then we're going to go look up mountain. And mountain is going to refer to hill, hill refers to mountain, and we go around and around until we eventually, uh, the battery on the computer dies. Okay, so, uh, as we look into the rest of the this lecture, we're going to do a couple things. We'll continue to talk about recursive definitions and data structures, focus on arbitrarily versus infinite, and then we'll dive into some recursive code. Alright, those are the objectives for today. Uh, please go ahead and read um, Recursion Through Infinite Recursion in Chapter 5. This is the Downey book. And then in Chapter 6, more recursion through the end. It's just the last little bit of that chapter. Now, they broke it up into two parts there. Okay, so I already introduced the idea that recursive definitions contain the term in the body of the definition. Um, but this is actually really common in mathematical definitions. And in general, they're done in a meaningful way. So, for example, here, uh, x is a positive even number if number one x is two or x is equal to another positive even number plus two so that means that four will be a positive even number because it's equal to x plus two six will be a positive even number because it's equal to four plus two we already know that four is in our set of positive even numbers and I can just keep going like this I can say that well six plus two is eight so 8 must be a positive even number. And 10 is a positive even number. It's 8 plus 2. Um, and I can just keep doing this forever. Um, now there's two things here. I want to point out that I have a base case where x is equal to 2, or a recursive case where I'm using some my definition here in red, positive even number, and making some little change to it. All right. Um, recursive data structures are going to be data structures that have the same kind of data structure embedded in them. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a, a list. See the square brackets right there? That list, rows, contains three lists. One, two, three. Here we go. Um, did we draw this right? Oh yeah, rows has is three items. One, two, three, there's rows. This is the variable on the left. This is the object on the right. And then each of these objects contain um, more lists. So this one has a string A in it and another list. So this is going to be a reference to that other list, the 1, 2. Uh, list here contains B and uh, a second list also with 3, 4, and 5 in it. Uh, you get the idea. So lists that contain lists that contain lists are recursive data structures. And we'll be using these in some of our examples later in uh, today's lecture. Okay, and when you guys start looking, you're going to start to see recursive structures everywhere. We'll see them in nature. Uh, my other two demonstrations for today are file structures, uh, directories, uh, and file formats.
Okay, so let's take a look at nature. This is a definition of a tree as written by a computer scientist. So it's a little weird, uh, but, we'll, but work with me here. It's designed to be instructive. All right, so uh, the term is branch, and a branch is a wooden stick with an end splitting into other branches or terminating with a leaf. So here's my first stick. It has more sticks, in this case three sticks on the end of it, and they can either terminate with a leaf or they can have other branches attached to them. And those branches can be either terminated with a leaf or have other branches. So I've got two cases here. Again, I've got my base case terminating with a leaf. That's going to end the recursion process and stop whatever's happening there. Or branches, which can have other branches. This is going to be the recursive case where we keep getting larger and larger trees. Okay. Yep. So that means that trees can be arbitrarily large and recursive uh, allows for basically indefinite growth. It can keep going. But here I want to highlight that arbitrarily is not equal to infinitely. There's always going to be this case where it could stop. Where's my leaf word? Yep, right there. I'm going to circle that. There's going to be a case where it can stop. So it's not going to be infinite. Um, there's nothing that's going to stop it from adding more and more and more. But there will always be a case where, well, let me just put it this way. In order for this to be meaningful, it needs to stop. Uh, we need to be able to get to the end. It's not going to be an infinite loop. We need to actually be able to solve a problem. So these infinite, uh, I'm sorry, the recursive data structures, recursive functions, recursive uh, things in nature, the goal is that we're trying to solve a problem if we're writing a recursive function. That means we need to get to the end of the problem with a solution. So we're not going to have an infinite uh, loop. We're not going to have an infinitely deep data structure. We need to solve whatever problem we're working on. Hence, the, that's why we're going to focus on arbitrarily. It can be a, a problem as big as we want, but it's not going to be infinite because then we'll never get to a solution. That's where the meaningful part of things comes in. Um, yep, okay, so I mentioned base case. Base case, branch, got that already. Okay, so next example. Um, file systems. We've been working with folders and or directories on our computers uh, all semester long. Uh, directories are, in fact, uh, recursive data structures. So the definition of a directory is a collection of files and directories. So here I have uh, an example from Finder. I've got directory A containing two or the directories, B and B2, and some files. So these files would be leaves. They cannot contain anything. Well, at least can't contain more files or directories. And directories are like the branches. They can contain other files and other directories. So if we open up uh, directory B, for example, you can see that it contains directory C and a file. Again, this will be a branch, and that will be kind of like a leaf. Uh, directory C can contain other files. So um, I probably did too much here. Keep going, another file. Inside keep going, we have directory Z all the way down. That can contain even more. You definitely did too much. Okay, but you get the idea. All right, even something like uh, file formats. Um, here we have a simplified JSON format. And I'm going to define a JSON dictionary as a set of JSON mappings. Okay? Um, now, a definition of a JSON mapping, uh, here we have an example over here. We have keys and values. This is a JSON dictionary. Okay, a JSON mapping is a JSON string, the key, paired with a JSON string or JSON number or JSON dictionary. So here we have a string, here we have a number. Um, JSON dictionary is another possibility for the value. And so here I have JSON dict, up here is JSON dict, Okay, so it's not a direct uh, recursion, uh, it's indirect. I'm going through another definition of JSON mappings, but it eventually it comes back around. Okay, oh yeah, all right, got a slide for this. Recursion is uh, not always direct. Okay, so here under exams, I've added another element, another key. I have another dictionary. Um, in fact, I can keep going. I can say the midterm is going to be, in fact, yet another dictionary, and the final will be another dictionary. Um, and so, yeah, my very first dictionary. So think about it like this. The dictionaries or lists are going to be like branches, and the data they contain, the strings or numbers, will be the leaves. All right, at this point, we're going to start moving into recursive code. So what is recursive code? It's uh, very straightforward. This is just going to be a function that calls itself, and potentially indirectly. So here I have function f calling function f. Indirectly, function g calls function h. 
and h calls function g. So I get this, this circular sort of structure, f or gh. Um, what's this look like? Uh, we know how to call functions. So here I have the function definition for f. I've got some code. Somewhere in there is going to be a function call that calls f. So I'm just f with parentheses behind it. Um, some other code. So this will call f. It's going to go back up, f, and around in a circle. Uh, we'll need a way to get out of that loop for this to be meaningful. In G, we've got some code. This calls H, other code. Um, when we get to H, we've got some code. This is going to call G and jump back up here. So pretty straightforward. Um, but there are some tricks. Uh, oh, but first, uh, why do we care? What's the motivation? So some of the reasons we care is that we often don't know how big our data set is. We've talked about this before. This was the primary motivation behind iteration. Um, uh, iteration and recursion are equally powerful techniques. In theory, any problem we can solve with iteration can also be solved with recursion. And any problem that can be solved with recursion can also be solved with iteration. So think about this as like another way to loop through all of our data. Um, now, there's almost always one version that's easier and or simpler or faster uh, or just straight up makes the code more understandable one of these is going to be better um, but it could be either one all right so and in addition another way to think about this is recursion is a way that takes a gigantic big problem and turns it into a smaller problem it's going to reduce the size of the problem so i don't know if you guys have ever watched anybody cut down a tree but here's this giant tree next to a house and so when the uh, Texas tree surgeons come in, they're going to climb up in the tree and then cut it down in pieces. And they're going to see that each of these branches looks kind of like a tree. So they're going to take off basically a baby tree, the branches at the top. And then they're going to work their way down and make the tree smaller and smaller as they go through. There we go. I couldn't resist everybody. This is my dad up there. He's 73 years old. Just. Just check out the way he's standing on that ladder. One foot on top of the ladder, precariously balanced in the tree, cutting a branch off the tree right next to the house. I want to point out that the branch is falling on my son, who's holding the ladder while I'm taking this picture. So this is not a parent of the year kind of moment. I probably shouldn't share this, but uh, I've done this. I've cut down trees, and I think, you know, just hope everybody smiles at this one. All right. All right, and then the next piece, uh, if we were in class, we would do this demo. I'm not sure if Mina talked about it in her lecture or not. I'm going to totally skip this one because it's designed for like a classroom where there are people sitting there and you've got like other students around you to talk. But you can check out the slides if you're interested in what we do in the live classroom. It's not going to work if it's just me sitting here in the basement office recording videos. So I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead. One second. I should also mention that the hat I'm wearing is not a, a black top hat. It's a regular baseball hat, so I don't I don't own a top hat, but it looks good in the picture, does it not? All right, as we move into the next section of this lecture, I want to talk about um, creating um, recursive functions that solve a problem. That's my goal. I want to get there. And to get there, I'm going to go through an example, and the one I'm going to do first is factorial. So factorial is a mathematical function. Uh, if you guys don't remember what it is, it's uh, n factorial is just 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times all the way up to n. So that's the definition of factorial. So as I go through and try and come up with a recursive function for this, I want to introduce you guys to Mike's four-step system to writing recursive functions. Um, actually, I stole this from Tyler. This is Tyler's four-step system, but I color-coded it. So it's better now with color. All right, so here's the idea. The first thing we're going to do is write out a bunch of different examples. We're going to start with the really simple examples um, and then work our way up to bigger and bigger problems. Just like that game I mentioned when I had the title slide up. Um, still never figured that one out. But anyway, so one factorial is the simplest thing we can do. It's just going to be one and then we're done. Two, uh, next simplest, we're going to have one times two and then we stop there because n is equal to two. Three, we got one times two is times three. Four is one times two times three times four. Okay, you guys get the idea. We're going to write down a bunch of examples. All right, then uh, we're going to look for patterns that allow us to write this in uh, terms of self-reference. So I'm going to look for patterns. So check this out. Right here, I've got 1, 2, 3 times 4. And in 4, I've got 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. 
So that means I can take this red block right here and replace it with this 4 factorial. Okay, so that's what I've done here. 5 factorial is now 4 factorial times 5. All right, I'm going to look for more patterns now. Here's another one. So I've got 1 times 2 times 3 in the definition of 4 factorial, and there's a 1 times 2 times 3. And that is the definition of 3 factorial. So that means in 4 factorial, I can replace this much with 3 factorial. I'm going to write it right here. 3 factorial times 4. All right, and then I keep going. 2 factorial times 3, 1 factorial times 1. So after this, oh, and then one more. I don't need a pattern for 1. This is just the base case. It needs somewhere to start. All right, so next up, after I have that, I'm going to try and convert all of these self-referring examples into a single recursive definition. So I'm going to try and take these guys, put them into one definition. And this is always going to have two parts for um, a recursive function. First, I have the base case. Uh, personally, I highly recommend writing the base case first. That way you don't forget it. It's really easy to do because uh, the exciting part is the recursive case. Let's face it, 1 factorial is 1. Very simple. Write it first, get it out of the way. And this is our, our base case or the leaf. This is what's going to terminate the recursion when I get down to the end of it. Okay, then I'm going to take a look at everything else in this box. These are all the things that recursive they have a recursive definition. I've got factorial in the definition in every single one of these. So in this case, uh, if I have n factorial, it's equal to 1 less, or n minus 1 factorial times n. All right, so I'm going to fill this in with n minus 1 factorial times n. And there it is. I'm done. This is my recursive case. I've got my branch there to remind myself that. All right, next up, I'm just going to turn this into some Python code. So the first thing, all of these are going to have a conditional. It could be an if statement. It could be one of the loops. They all have conditionals. It might have like a for loop that never runs um, for the base case or runs only once. Um, but anyway, uh, while loops, if statements, for loops, they all have conditionals built into them. We will have one of those. Uh, conditional is 99% of the time the most common thing you'll see. And all of the examples I'm going to do will have an if statement. Okay, so my definition of factorial, if n is exactly equal to 1, then we're just going to return 1. That takes care of my base case, the leaf right there. Otherwise, um, I'm going to compute p. That's uh, this part right here, factorial of n minus 1. And then I'm going to compute uh, p times n to finish up this whole line and return that. This will be my branch because it is calling the function. Okay, and another thing, uh, the recursive case needs to make progress towards the base case. So the base case here is n equal to 1. I have a number bigger than 1. I need to get closer and closer and closer to 1 in order to make this a smaller and smaller problem so that eventually I solve it. All right, so let's take this code and just run through it. And by run through it, I mean have about 50 PowerPoint slides that break this down into a lot of very small steps so we can focus on the details. All right, so to get started, somebody is going to be calling this function, factorial. In this case, my example, I'm going to use 4. So what I've got here in this box is just um, each box is going to represent a function. Invocation, these are not stack frames yet. We'll go through that version in a few minutes. Uh, just I want to just trace this and keep track of what's going on. So I'm going to use this sort of box picture. All right, so when someone calls factorial with n equal 4, the first thing that's going to happen as we're going to ask is n equal to 1. That would be the base case. It is not. So we're going to jump down and say p is equal to factorial n minus 1. So the first thing Python's going to do is say, okay, we need to simplify this factorial n minus 1 before I can store it in p. So I need to go get that number. So it's going to call factorial n minus 3 next. So now I've got another box here. This is representing a function invocation. So I'm, I'm kind of just going to go through the code in order of all the steps that are run um, and put boxes around which function invocation things happen in. All right. After this, um, it's going to go back inside of the factorial n equals 3 function. It's going to say now is n equal to 1. The answer is no. So it's going to say, okay, jump down p equals factorial n minus 1. It needs to simplify this so I get a number that I can store in p. Um, or a list, or a string, or a data structure of some type. In this case, it's going to be a number that I can store in p. So I need to call factorial of n minus 1 again. So n minus 1 will be 2. 
I'm going to call the function with n equal to 2. And then we'll jump back up here. Is n equal to 1? No, it's not. It's still 2. So then we're going to call factorial again before I can store it in p with 1 less. So 2 minus 1 is 1. So now n is equal to 1. We jump up here. Is n equal to 1? Yes, finally. So this is going to return 1. That's the next line of code that runs. We're going to store 1 in p. But this is the, when it returns, I'm no longer in this function invocation. I'm now in this one, the one where n was equal to 2. So I'm going to do this return now. I'm going to compute n times p, or 2 times 1, and I'm going to return 2. Okay, that's the next line of code that runs. When I return, I'm going to jump up to the next function invocation. I'm going to store that return value, the 2, in the variable p here. Um, that's the p from this function invocation, the one where n is equal to 3. The next line that runs is return, um, in this case, 2 times 3, which is 6. And that 6 gets stored in p, but that's the p from this outermost factorial when n is equal to 4. So p is equal to 6 here. And then, uh, last thing I'm doing, I'm going to return, in this case, 4 times 6, or 24. And that goes back to whoever called this function. All right, a couple of little details here. We have a lot of variables with the same name. So there's four different n's, three different p's. Uh, how does Python keep track of all this? And the answer is really simple. Uh, you should be able to guess this one. We're going to use frames. All right, in fact, I've got a lot of different function invocations. Each one of those will get their very own frame with their very own set of variables. And they can be named anything we want. And in fact, the primary reason for frames like the number one reason that we have frames in programming at all is so that we can use the same variable names in more than one place. All right, so let's quick take a deep dive and look at the idea of invocation state. Uh, this Forget the word invocation, that just means I call the function, but state is going to be the set of variables that are active at each, uh, in each function. Um, we're also going to see that, oh, let me flip back a second. So every single one of these functions use this code right here. The functions are sharing code, but they each got their own set of variables. They each have their own n and their own p. So in each box, there's exactly one n and one p, except for this one, it never actually made it to the code where it defines p, it returned too soon. So the innermost one never needed that p, the recursive part. Okay, so variables for an invocation exist inside of a frame. So here I have a frame, it's got variables. All right, frames are stored on the stack or the call stack, um, and we'll have exactly one active frame at a time. Uh, I gotta admit here, I've drawn the picture upside down from the way we've seen it in Python Tutor. This is the way almost all programming uh, books and uh, other instructors will draw things. They draw things as a stack, like if you have a stack of plates, and you put a new plate on it, you put it on the top. That's where the name stack comes from. Um, Python Tutor draws it upside down. Uh, part of me wishes I'd flipped the colors and just ma made it match, but this is so common, you're likely going to see the stack drawn this way other places as you continue on in computer science that it's probably worth re realizing that it doesn't really matter which way you draw the stack. It is reversed from Python Tutor. Um, so a heads up. Uh, all right, anyway, it's going to work the same way. The frames are going to be stored in a stack. We'll have exactly one active frame. Those are the variables that are going to be active at that moment. Everything else is going to be dormant. Um, and that frame, yeah, that frame will be on top of the stack. Uh, if a function calls itself, we'll have multiple frames with exactly the same name, one for each invocation of the function. They can use variables with the same name, but those will be different variables. They'll be stored in different regions of the memory. Okay, that version I just went through with the boxes like two minutes ago. In that one, I was going through the code line by line and just drawing boxes around which uh, invocation everything belonged to. This is the real version with the stack diagram. So at the very beginning, um, we're going to have the global frame. And somewhere in there, uh, the current frame here is marked in red. That frame is going to call factorial. And in this case, we're calling factorial 3. So it's going to create a new frame. The code is going to jump into this factorial function, and we'll have n defined as 3 as the very first line of code right here. So the red line is the line that's about to execute, or just executed, I guess. 
So here we have a new active frame, the one drawn in red. First thing we do is n equal to 1. Um, no, it's not, so we jump down here. We're going to need to define p. Um, so we'll be calling factorial of n minus 1. This is going to generate a new frame. So check this out. Along the bottom here, I've got time. So right now, this is the invocation that's active. We're just going to watch the clock go by. So we've called another function. We add in a new frame to the top of the stack. Um, in this case, n is equal to 2. Right there, it's going to skip over this n equals 1 line. I need to call factorial one more time with n minus 1. So as soon as I call that, I'm going to advance the clock. I'm going to get a new frame for when we call factorial of n equal 1. It's going to get added to the top of the stack here. And we'll go through this one. Now we finally run this n equals 1, and this function is going to return 1. So here it is. We're returning 1. We've reached the base case. This base case um, gets us the number 1, and that's going to be stored in the variable p. All right, check this out. This function never actually created the variable p. It never reached that. It returned before it got there. And this one is going to return 1. I'm going to put a 1 right there, store that in p. And now I have enough information that I can return from this function. So I'll compute 2 times 1. I get 2. And that's going to get, here we go, returned, uh, 2 is uh, 2 times 1, into as time progresses, we'll, we'll pop those red active frame off the top of the stack. This one becomes active. The return value goes right here into p. Right there, p is now 2. All right. And now we have enough information that this function invocation, we just finished this line up here with the orange p, it can return. It's going to be returning, uh, in this case, 3 times 2. So returning 6 to the global frame. And then the global frame is going to do whatever it wanted to with that p, uh, with that function call, uh, the 6. Most likely stored in a variable or printed out, whatever the, the global frame wanted to do. Okay, next up. Uh, just some common bugs. Two things that go wrong with almost everybody's code at some point when they're like learning recursion. So number one, what happens if uh, what happens if we call factorial with a negative number? So uh, what we're going to see here is that if n equals 1, it's not. It skips down. Then we'll do a smaller number, uh, negative 2. Then n with negative 2 is not equal to 1. Subtract 1. It will never actually reach the point where it gets to 1. So we'll just keep subtracting negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. It will never reach 1. Yeah, so in that case, we'll have an infinite loop uh, version that doesn't meaningfully solve any problem uh, and never will reach the base case, never terminates, and this is a bug. Uh, Python Tutor will stop us after about 1,000 iterations, I believe. Um, to be honest, it's all right. It's not. It will terminate. I lied there. Uh, so innocent lie. Um, part of the reason that this is this will terminate is your computer has finite resources, and every time we call this function, it needs a little more memory to remember what n is, and a little bit more memory to remember what the next n is, and a little bit more memory for the next n. It also needs to remember where to call back to. So it's storing at least two pieces of information, where to jump back to in the code, and the variable for the parameters. And so that's going to slowly use up all the memory in your computer, and when your computer runs out of memory, it will crash. So um, infinite is bad, and this is not like an infinite loop, like a while loop while true. That doesn't actually take any more memory uh, every time that you go through the loop, but this one will. OK, now the other really common bug um, is what if we forget the n minus 1 check? Uh, I told you guys a moment ago, write the base case first. Don't forget the base case. It's so simple. It's not the really you know exciting part of the function. It doesn't really do very much. It's just like, if this, then return something. Write it first so you don't forget. All right, if you do forget this n equals 1 check, and you call factorial 3, it's going to call factorial 2, then factorial 1, then factorial 0, then factorial minus 1. It's never going to stop. So 3, 2, 1, 0, minus 1. It's going to go on forever. And again, by forever, I mean until your computer runs out of memory. Every single one of these needs to remember uh, the parameter n and where to return to when we're done with the function. All right, next up I want to go into, I'm just going to do one coding demo for today. Um, and that's, uh, I'm going to call this function pretty printing. 
The goal of this function is going to be to take a list of lists and we're going to print it out so that at the top level, and you guys have seen this before, bulleted lists. If I have a bulleted list with A and B and then I have a sub list, I'm going to indent those over, I'm going to throw in some stars, I'm going to print that out. If I have uh, another list inside of that, another level of indentation, uh, what are they called, sub bullets, uh, I'm going to go ahead and print those out with uh, one more level of indentation, some stars. So we're going to tab things over. We're going to make this look really good. All right, let me go ahead and pull up Jupyter Notebook. You guys can follow along with me as I go through this. All right, so I've got some template code to get me started here. So I'm following my function pretty print. It's going to take uh, parameter items. Right now it's not doing anything. And down below here I have my data. So this is just a list that contains a list. This uh, third one here contains a third list, uh, third level of depth. Then I'm just going to call pretty print with my data. And again, as you guys are writing code for your homework, I highly encourage you to write one line of code and print something out. In this case, I'm just going to print out items to just see where we're at. Control Enter will run this and it's not going to move my um, uh, focus down to the next cell. So I'm going to print something out after every line of code that I write. Good strategy. Uh, I've seen a lot of people in office hours who bring in 30 lines of code with not a single print statement in there. First thing we do is I make you put them in. So go ahead, just start that out for me before you come to office hours. All right, so great. We printed out items. It's printing it out as a regular list. Uh, but what I really want is every item on its own line. So I'm going to go ahead and do this a little differently. We're just going to loop through the list and print out the items. So here we'll do for item in items. Does that work for everybody? And then we'll print out not items, but item singular. All right, let's try this. Control Enter. Um, that's looking good. So the top level I've got A, then it's going to print out this list, then we've got B, then it's going to print out this list containing that list. So there we go. Alright, next up I'm going to go ahead and add the star here. So let's print out a star and then we'll add item to it. Oh, whoa, wait a second, what did I do? Ta oh, I'm trying to concatenate a string and a list. So right here, um, item. First time through is A. That's a string. Star plus string works great. I got that. Next up, I'm trying to do star plus list. That does, is not going to work. Fortunately, print is actually really intelligent. If I just switch this up to a comma, <clears throat> um, it knows how to print each of these things on its own. And now it's going to work just fine. There we go. Perfect. So now I'm printing star. Um, it's going to add a space for me. That's the generic sep wait, comma, and a space. That's the sep is equal to that. Remember, I've got all that control. I've got sep and end in the print statements. Um, then it's printing out the item. So first item is the string A. Second item is this list. Third item will be B. All right, now what I really want is not printing the entire list like this. I want to like flatten out this list and print out all of the items in this list also. Um, and then indent them over, of course. Now, remember a moment ago I told you guys to always start with the base case? This is the base case right here. I'm just printing out the top level stuff. Um, so I want to print A. If, there, if A is not a list or another dictionary or something, in this case I'm printing lists of lists. If it's not a list, then I just want to print it out and I'm done. Now the problem I'm running into is what if it's a list? So let me just go ahead. I'm going to push B to get another cell right here. If I wanted to, I've got something that prints out all the items in a list. Check this out. Uh, data of two, whoops, of one is a list, right? So if I run this cell, yeah, it's a list. What I can do is I can actually call pretty print on data of one, and that's going to print out the sublist. So what I really want to do is this sort of thing. And in this case, up here inside of this loop right here, item is actually going to be data one on the second time through the list. Item will be data zero the first time, the second time through it will be data one, the third time through it will be data two, and the fourth time it will be data three. Alright, so here's what I want to do. Um, 
you say, so, and again, all of my recursive functions are going to have an if statement or a conditional of some kind. If, and then um, what I want to know is if this is a list, then I want to call pretty print. If it's not a list, then I want to just print it out. So else, we'll do that. Okay, so something like that. If it's a list, pretty print it, else, tab that over, print the item. All right, so how do I write this? If type item, um, there you go. If it equals list, then I believe this works. Yes, it does. If you're uncertain of this, one of the things you can do is type of, and then let's just give it a list. This will be of type list. If I can't remember exactly what this is called, or I get the spelling wrong, or I'm uncertain of how this works, all I need to do is give it the type of something, and it'll match that for me automatically. All right, cool. If you guys ever need to do an experiment, this works great. This is a little more work for Python, so I'm going to go ahead and leave this as list. I just wanted to show you guys how you could experiment and take advantage of stuff that you've already learned from the class if you can't remember how this works. So there we go. I just ran that. It's still working. All right, next up, we can see that uh, we've flattened out the list. It's got all of the depth. Everything is covered. If I were to add another list in here with uh, lowercase a, b, c, d, and run that, it's going to work. It doesn't matter how many levels of depth. So it, it can handle something that's arbitrarily deep, but not infinite. Uh, computer's computer is going to run out of memory. I actually got a pretty good computer uh, here at home. It's, it can handle a pretty big list. All right, so what's missing now is the indentation. So let's go ahead and add um, something to keep track of the level of indentation, because it's going to change. The deeper in the list we go, the, the more indentation I'm going to want to see. So I'm going to add another variable. I'm going to call this indent. And this is just going to be an integer. So I'm going to call data, let's give it 5. And right here, when I print this out, I'm going to add spaces. So let's call spaces equals, we'll give it a space, times indent. And then right here, we'll do spaces plus that star. All right, so right now I've got spaces set at 5. When I run this, oh, I'm doing that same thing again, aren't I? Missing one required positional argument. Oh, no, where is that? Ah, when I called pretty print up here. This one is missing indent. Okay, so indent is called. It's going to be 5 right here. When I get here, it'll still be 5. Looking good. Okay. Please work, please work. Yes. Okay, so here it is at 5. Let's try 10. We should see this jump over. I'm going to put the mouse cursor right there. There we go. 10, 20. Should mouse cursor right there. Should jump over even more. Okay looking good. That indentation is working, but it's not like adaptive. It's it's printing everything at 20 spaces over. So I'm going to go ahead um, and let's just set this at zero for right now. Run that. There, everything at the top level we want to be indented zero spaces. Then as we go further and further in depth, what I really want to do is move it over. So when I call pretty print for the second level, of this list when I want to print out like that list right there but I really want us to do indent plus more I want to increase this so right there I'm just gonna add a plus two and let's go ahead every time I run this I want to print something out I'm gonna add a new print statement so here I'm gonna be printing items and in indent All right, let's see what we got here that's got a lot going on I'm gonna add one more thing here at the very end I'm gonna print um, how about return? And up here we'll print start. All right, let's try this. Okay, first time through the function, we're calling start. Here's the entire list. The level of indent is zero. Looking good. So then it's going to go through, it's going to print out A. Here we get to the point where I've got that second level of list. And yeah, so this is items of 1. It's calling with an indentation level of 2, and now it's going through and printing out that list, 1, 2, 3. Okay, then we're back. It's returning 
it hit that uh, final line right there and now it's going to go through and print out the third item from that top level list so we just got to b so it's going to print out b and then it's going to go through and find this monstrosity the next level so we're going to start this is the sub list whoops whoops hold on this is the sub list it's trying to print out it's a second level so indentation of two spaces we print out the four and then we hit this list okay that's this piece right here with all of the lowercase i's and this is going to be a third level so zero two and now four spaces of indent we can see it's spaced over four looking good um, then we get to this sub list with all the lowercase a b c d uh, so we hit start again when this function is called when pretty print is called again we go to start it's printing out the list it's going to print a b c d six levels of spaces and again it's tabbed all this over and then we finished up the function call that did the a b c d we finished up the function call that did the one two we returned from the function call that printed the four and we returned from the function call the very first one that call right there that printed the entire list. So we've got four levels of return at the very end. That last one was four levels deep, depth four. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple things now. I know it's working. I'm gonna get rid of all of this scaffolding printing. I don't need it anymore. If I can do control enter, it should print my list so that it looks really good. I love it, that looks great. And the other thing I wanna do, um, if you guys think back, we had three different kinds of parameters. We had positional, we had keyword and we had default parameters. I'm thinking that this would be a great place to use default parameters. So I'm going to take out that zero right there and just say indent equals zero. If we don't call it with anything, we don't want it to indent. Um, here, we're going to have to increase the indent. So we will call indent, we'll, we'll call pretty print with some indentation. Um, this should not change anything. It should still work exactly the same. I'm going to push go. It flickers and we can see that we're getting the exact same result. All right, guys, I just checked my notes, and there was one more thing that I wanted to mention here. So over here, when I came in across that first error where I was trying to add with the plus a list to a string, and that didn't work, one of the other solutions to that problem right here is to just do casting and turn the list into a string by just saying string. So that'll turn the list into a string, and then we can just use the addition like normal. So I can change this back to a plus. So let me go ahead and run this. Uh, control Enter will run that. Uh, notice that it removed the space between the star and my item. If I want that space back, I can just put a new space in right there after the star. Run this again, and now all the text will get shifted over with the space. Personally, I like it better. I think it looks better with the space. But depending on what you guys want to do with this function, it's up to you whether you want to keep that or not. All right, before I go edit this video and get it put up on YouTube for you guys, I just want to mention too that almost all of our PowerPoint presentations have extra demo problems at the end that we don't have time to do. This problem is a great practice problem. You know, you've got an exam coming up in just under two weeks, a recursive list search. And the goal here is to find out, does a given number exist in a recursive structure? So uh, we're going to write a function called contains and we're going to give it a number that we're going to check to see if this list somewhere contains the number three. And this is going to be a list of lists, uh, potentially lists, with an arbitrary depth. Um, so I'd like you guys to just take a stab at this. Uh, if you run into any trouble, bring it to office hours. Uh, think of this as just a great practice problem. And my advice is to do it right now after you're done watching the lecture. Um, Five minutes spent studying now is probably equal to 30 minutes spent studying the night before the exam. So I think it's a really good use of your time. Just make sure that you go through, think about, think about the process with the pretty print. We needed a base case. So if we find the three, then we want to return true. Um, otherwise, we need to keep looking through the list. And if we don't find it, the very last line will be return false. Um, we need to look at pretty much all the data until we find something. Um, and I recommend you break it down into some steps. So try and see if, uh, the top level, just iterate through the list. And then if you don't find it, some of these items in your list will be other lists. Call your contains function again on those items, just like we did with pretty print. And with kind of a fun joke from XKCD, 
All right. Uh, I just want to wish everyone to have a great weekend. And if you have any questions, bring them to office hours or post them on Piazza. Good luck with Project 8 and have a great day.